Welcome in, everybody, to another edition of Bears All Access, brought to you by IGS Energy. Wishing you a pleasant good evening on your Saturday uh, with my broadcast partner from News Radio 780 and 1059 WBBM, Chicago Bears Super Bowl winner, Tom there. Tom, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. Getting ready for a big homecoming, it seems, because we've been on the road so often this season. It's going to be great to be at home noon on Sunday. Yeah, back-to-back weeks after four trips in five. Absolutely. We're previewing week nine, the matchup tomorrow at Soldier Field, our pregame at nine, kickoff at noon on WBBM. Coming up, we'll join by... Coming up, we'll be joined by wide receiver Nikhil Harry, and then later in the program, Joe Rose, the outstanding analyst and former Dolphin tight end as we break down Bears and Dolphins. Thanks to our producers, Dan Barilli and Jordan Treadup, and the folks here at The Score. So uh, let's not dwell on it because it's, it's happened early in the week and we want to focus on the game tomorrow, but uh, what are your impressions of, of basically a swap of Robert Quinn, Roquan Smith, to Philadelphia and Baltimore in exchange for future draft compensation, wide receiver Chase Claypool, and linebacker A.J. Klein. I I think you have to look at everything in regards to the future. And I think it's trying to set up a roster that's going to come in here and be able to compete, compete for division championships and then ultimately go deep into the playoffs. And if you wanted to look at guys with the end of their contracts or at the guys that wanted a new contract, you really didn't know how those things were going to work themselves out. So if you could get some draft capital to bring in some young men that's going to help the future of this roster, I'm all for it. All right, Chase Claypool is uh, the intriguing person right now. He's got every tool in the shed. He's got experience. He had success in Pittsburgh, certainly in his rookie year with Ben Roethlisberger. Here's more insight from Bears wide receivers coach Tyke Tolbert. He has a lot of physical traits you like. Um, um, He's big. He's fast. He has a has a 40-inch vertical, uh, he's got big hands. Um, he's played in this region before, been in Notre Dame, so the cold weather, the wind, none of that will bother him as much. So uh, he has a lot of positive things to look for. How about his personality and attitude towards the game? Uh, it's been good since he's been here. Um, you know, when he first got here, you know, we sat down and had a talk with him about how we do things here and his last couple of days in practice, you know, how we practice hard, how we finish hard and everything. You know, had to remind him a couple of times. Um, he said, yeah, yeah, I got to get used to doing it, you know, this way all the time. So um, all that's been positive. Uh, how, example of that. Just finishing on every play, whether you have the ball or not. Okay. You now, sometimes it's easy for a receiver to uh, go out for a pass play or, you know, a run play. Somebody else is carrying the ball. You just kind of stop and watch. But we don't stop and watch here. We finish every play with, with or without the ball. Uh, what have stat. you seen on tape of Claypool's run, run blocking prowess? Because of his size. In, in, his, in his strength, he's good at it. You know, he can finish better, you know, and we'll, he'll conform to what we're doing because we're finishers with this group. So, and I think he's going to get so much better in what he is. Well, you can count on that because Tyke Tolbert, he, we've talked about this before, he, he'll, he'll show these guys their great blocks over their great catches. You're right, 6'4", 238, biggest wide receiver in the NFL. When you talk about the bodies he's going to be blocking against are undersized cornerbacks and safeties. So the the immediate advantage goes to Chase Claypool. Um, And then when you look at comparative stats between he and Darnell Mooney, Clay 39 games, Mooney 41 games. Clay's got 153 catches. Mooney's got 167 catches. So he's a great complement to the opposite side of what Darnell Mooney can still offer the Bears than what Chase Claypool can bring aboard. And and I don't know how you think about this either. You know, I, I keep mentioning a basketball team, and you kind of want that on your offense, right? Well, you, you've got, you got two backs that are feisty and will fight for every inch and are good pass catchers. You got Cole Komet still untapped in terms of getting him the football and feeding him the football, certainly in in key leverage situations on third down in the red zone. And now you got two six foot four athletic receivers, Nikhil Harry and Chase Claypool, with Darnell Mooney can move all over the formation. I know Luke Getze wants these guys to play all these positions and they want to spread the ball around. Uh, and then you got Dante Pettis, you got Pringle coming back, you got Ryan Griffin, Equiminius St. Brown at 6'5", also proving yep. uh, himself as well. So it, it is a basketball team uh, pretty much in this case. Yeah, of course. You know, it's all about continuous first downs. And if you don't have Pro Bowl receivers, you have a quarterback back to on the cusp of being a Pro Bowl quarterback. But you think of over Chase's time in Pittsburgh, of his 53 catches on third down, 43 of them have went for first downs. And that's the key ingredient here. 
is keep your offense on the field and keep those first downs going. You know that you can get them on the running game, but you need them in the passing game equally as well. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll be joined by one of those six foot four receivers, Nikhil Harry, here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Welcome back to Bears All Access here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Tom Thayer will be along in our next segment as well. We're here with a Bears wide receiver, Nikhil Harry. His first touchdown as a Bear, we got to start there, right? Welcome in, and thank you for taking the time. Uh, it's always good to get that first one, right? Yes, sir. Break, break that one down for us. Um, so, notice pre-snap man coverage. Um, he had no help inside, so I just tried my best to get on his toes, um, you know, get, a, get out of my break well and, you know, Justin delivered a uh, a nice ball and the rest is history. Yeah, this man, you can't see it, folks. He's got a big smile on his face, right? Because the thing is, he did throw a nice ball, but you're so big at 6'4", you can shield off that defender, and uh, you're showing him his, your, your numbers, right? So he can see that. He sees the color. And, and I often hear, and a lot of people don't uh, understand sometimes the nuances of route running, which is uh, very specific. But when you say you get on a guy's toes, does that mean you, you you're, you're complicating his ability to shift his feet, correct? Is that, yeah. Explain that in more detail. So basically, on a route like that, the, the further away from him that you break, the easier it is for him to, to break on the ball and, you know, make a play on the ball. Um, so when you step on his toes like that, you're kind of like you're, you're limiting that space and you get all up in his space and DBs feel uncomfortable when you, you get all up in their space. So um, kind of <laughs> made it hard for him and – you know, hopefully made it easier for the quarterback. I can hear him whispering, get out of my area code, wait, get out of my zip code. Uh, but it, it is good to have you on the field. And I don't know when the last time you played 45 snaps in a game, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, missed the first six this year. So you didn't get a ton of targets, but, you know, it's a slow process when you're reintroduced to, uh, especially a new system like this one. But it did feel good to you to be on the field for 45, I think it was 45 snaps. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it, it feels good being out there. Um you know, I wasn't too worried about how much I got targeted, um, how many catches I had. Um, you know, I got a lot of opportunities to block last game. So, you know, I really enjoyed that. So. Again, the smile. The man's got the killer instinct <laughs> in the blocking game. I saw that back at Arizona State and New England. Uh, why do you love that so much? Um, I guess it's just getting to impose your will. You know, there's not a lot of sports out there that you get to impose your will on somebody else like that. I um, mean, you know, I'm a big guy, so, you know, that's that's a role that I take pride in. And, you know, however I can help this team win, which run blocking is, is, is an important, a very important part of the game. Um, you know, so I take a lot of pride in that. You know, a lot of teams want to run the ball. They say they want to run. We have to establish the run. But this team, this team is just going out there doing it. And number one in the league, is, is there a pride factor in this now for all 11? Uh, the tight ends, love, Cole Komet, you know, People always want to say, ah, oh, you know, he loves blocking. Like He's worked on that. Uh, you know, Darnell Mooney throws his body around like that. He's not as big as you. Uh, is it prideful, though, for the whole unit to see the production in that aspect? Yeah, absolutely. Because when it comes to blocking, um, you know, we kind of feel like that's having your brother's back. Um, you know, it's easy to go out there and run a bunch of routes. And I wouldn't say easy, but um, – you know, it's a lot more difficult for receivers to go out there and just, you know what I'm saying, just lay their body on the lines. There's a lot of receivers that don't like to block. Um, but everybody in our wide receiver room, you know, we take a lot of pride in that. And, you know, our coaches are honest about that. So we we, we, make, we try to make sure we come through every game. Heck, Anya about it. Tyke Tolbert told me he, he cuts up uh, the clips of the, the blocks before he ever puts the big catches on yeah. there. Is that true? And then how serious is he about it? Because he's pretty transparent. That guy tells yeah, you exactly absolutely. how he feels. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, we love we love Coach Tyke. All of us do. Um, but, yeah, you know, I think he takes just as much pride as we do in blocking. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very important part of the game and, and, and uh, an important part of our offense. Um, so, you know, he, he makes sure we know – how important it is for us to go out there and, and not only just give the effort to block, but have the right technique and have the right position on certain blocks. Nikhil Harry, our guest here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Tom Thayer will be along as well. The Bears getting ready to meet the Miami Dolphins. So uh, now your receiving core is basically a basketball team. Okay, you got Big Cole at 6'6", six, six. you got Griff, the other tight end in there. Uh, you got yourself at 6'4", uh, and now you get another 6'4", 240-pounder in Chase Claypool. Uh, you guys could be twins, so there's going to be twin towers out there. Uh, I don't know if you're 
paths have crossed prior to this. Uh, he was a 2020 draft pick, I believe number 49. You were number 32 in 2019. So you had two top 50 receivers who can run, who can jump. And he had a 40 vertical. I think yours was 38. Uh, and you got the site. What does this mean for the Chicago Bears, and have you ever crossed paths with them prior? Um, I haven't really crossed paths with them prior, but, you know, we're excited. Uh, we get another talented wide receiver coming here, help us win games. Um, so, you know, we're just going to try to get him acclimated to the offense as, as fast as possible, and, you know, we're, we're super excited to have him. The, the mind starts, you know, it's amazing how the addition of one – I consider you a major addition right now because you missed the first six, unfortunately, with that injury – but you, you just added two top 50 players in their respective drafts at this kind of size. Now you could maneuver Darnell in different ways. You got the number one ranked rushing offense. Justin starting to feel it. Um, is the final nine games of this more like almost a new sl- set of games with the, the additions? Uh, I think Pringle will be coming off soon. I mean, everybody's healthy. It's a pretty healthy football team. Cody might be coming back this week. Do you, do you feel like this is a – Kind of a new floor set up here. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, just having – getting him added into our offense, you know, opens up a lot. You know, it's a, it's another um, threat that defenses have to take seriously and will take seriously because he could take the top off. Um, and then we get BP back. So, you know, we have a lot of depth at receiver. So, God forbid somebody does go down, we have we have that depth there. And, you know, if coach wants to keep us fresh, he can rotate us in and out. So, um we're excited. We're excited. You got the double whammy. You you get moved, and, and that was a good thing for you. I think you would agree. And then you get the injury. Were you crushed, or is it just part of the game? You know what? A lot of guys get, you know, dinged up a little bit, and they got to re- restart a little bit. Um, I was definitely crushed, Yeah, um, especially um, figuring out that I had to get surgery and I was going to miss, um, you know, six, seven weeks. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, my teammates, my family – coaches you know they did a great job you know keeping my spirits up helping me see the 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 positive of the situation um so you know the initial reaction was definitely I was definitely um, upset and I was definitely crushed but um you know they did a great job helping me bounce back and, and keep my head into it do you think it helped you learn the offense better on the sideline just uh maybe let's let's look at some really silver lining to it um because you were you're very much engrossed in that i knew i knew from hearing the people you know you were really picking it up good so do you think yeah. that helped yeah it definitely in a weird way yeah definitely because there's a lot of moving parts in this offense you know it's not i wouldn't say this is an easy offense to grasp um you really have to put in not only time in the building but extra time by yourself um if you really want to understand the offense how you need to to be able to go out there and do everything that you need to do correctly um, so, yeah, those those first six weeks being out, it definitely did help me. But, um, you know, getting back on the practice field actually helped a lot more, I feel like, just because there's no substitute for yeah. getting out there and getting real reps with, with the team. What makes this offense challenging in your opinion? Um, well, the first thing that was challenging for me is some of the terms we had were the same terms I had in New England, but they meant a whole, oh, no. they meant a whole different thing. So. Um, That'll get, jumble the brain a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I had to get you to that first. And then, you know, like I said, there's just a lot of moving parts. You know, there's a lot of thinking. There's a lot of things that you need to know pre-snap, post-snap. Um, you know, so it was a bit difficult at first, but nothing that, you know, nothing that we can't handle. Yeah, it'd be, it'll be a great feeling when the moment comes, you can just let it rip, right? You don't have to think. Yeah. You know, right? Yeah, which is kind of how I felt last game. Um, Good. You know, the first game, I feel like I felt pretty comfortable. But last game, um, you know, I – feel like I knew the script from top to bottom so what's the challenge of change and meaning going from one organization to another you're still a young player long career left ahead of you but what, what is the challenge of that for us who don't really understand all that um you know kind of finding your place um you know you're on a whole different team um you have to make new relationships with guys you have to um kind of just figure out your spot on the team and um try to find a way to bring the most value to that new team. Um, you know, I was pretty acclimated in New England, so I kind of knew what I was getting into going into the season. But this this time around, I didn't really know mm-hmm. what was going on. I didn't know where I would fit into the offense. Also learning a completely different offense. Um, so um, it was, it was kind of difficult at first, but like I said, nothing that I couldn't handle. Will you be able to help? Chase then, because he's never been traded either. 
Uh, I know he's got a big personality, so he's probably going to light up the room a little bit. But can you help him with that in terms of maybe closing the gap? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we'll be able to help him on the field. If he has any questions, we'll be able to have his back on that. Um, but also as a wide receiver room, I feel like we're, we're very close um, as a group. And, you know, I feel like he'll come and fit right in. Gail Harry, our guest here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670. The score, or one more segment to go with the veteran wide receiver. First day, timeout here on 670 The Score. This portion of Bears All Access is brought to you by CDW. People who get it, learn more at CDW.com. Jeff Joniak top there along with Nikhil Harry, the Bears a veteran wide receiver, getting ready to meet the Miami Dolphins. I read you said you feel like you have to be an enforcer in this offense because of the run game. And clearly because of your size and your physicality that fits your game, have you always excelled in that? We touched on it early in the segment. If people are just joining us, we did talk on the run game, but even at Arizona State. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been that way since high school. Um, you know, my coaches have always made sure that um, because of my size that um, I do block like that, and DBs hate <laughs> block like that. Do you hear it? That's that you're hustling you a little bit? Yeah, definitely. They don't they don't like it at all. So I take I take a uh, – it's just pretty fun out there to, to, to get the mess with those guys. So if they're talking, are you talking? Are you, you – you seem like a reserved, quiet guy, are you? Um, It depends. Or not on game day? It, it, it kind of depends, yeah. Sometimes, you know, I, 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 I tend to get a little bit chippy in there. I try not to. I try to, you know, keep it within the, within the lines, you know, keep it within my play. But sometimes it's just too – yeah, too much. you know, I don't think this coaching staff would love it, right? If you, <laughs> Matt Heberflus, so yeah. you know, I brought it up to him because I do a coaches show with him every Monday night, and I, I brought up, hey, you know, it's it's interesting because he, his teams were not penalized very much uh, in Indianapolis, and same is, is the case here. But this team last year had they led the league in personal fouls, you know, like twenty nine of them, right? And that would not fly with yeah. Coach Eberflus, would it? No, yeah, there's there's no point in going out there and getting penalties like that. At the end of the day, all it does is hurt the team. So, um, do, you, do you have to you have to kind of compartmentalize that because th- there are some DBs. I'm not gonna name who they are, but you kind of know who they are. They get the rep in the league. They're gonna get under your skin just to agitate you, to create, it irritate you to the point. And, hey, what did I do? I didn't do anything. But then yeah. you know you draw the flag. That's not cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. The way I look at it is, um, you know, I I feel like I do that on the other end. Um, you know, I just try to block him as hard as I can, um, try to get a reaction. I did it to uh, Trayvon Diggs last year when, when we played him. Okay. Um, drew a penalty out of him. So I feel like, yeah, they could they could try to get under our skin, but I feel like, um, you know, I could probably do a better job getting under their skin. Because of your physicality, because of what Chase Brink, Cole can do the same thing, maybe in the red zone as well or, or work in that slot, can you draw flags for these PIs and so forth, because well, that, is that coming with the chemistry of Justin? Do a back shoulder, and you know maybe these guys get tangled up, and you get a you get a first down out yeah, of it. Definitely, that's I, I I don't go out there, you know, trying to draw sure. a PI, um, but you know we'll, we'll take yeah it. yeah we'll take it yeah we'll take it yeah uh, Aaron Rodgers gets that all the time up <laughs> there in Green Bay. Why not us? Yeah. All right, we're gonna go back in your history a little bit. Uh, the ninth true freshman at the time, I don't know if it's happened again, in Arizona State history to start your season opener. You put up great numbers with the Sun Devils, a pair of 1,000-yard uh, seasons, over 200 receptions, 22 touchdowns. How much fun did you have over there in the desert? It was so much fun. <laughs> you glad you went there? Yes, absolutely. You know, being home, you know, um, having my family be able to come and watch the games. Um, and, you know, that was a, a point in my career where um, – you know, I felt like I couldn't be touched. You know, they they would just throw the ball up to me. Um, you know, the coaching staff had had a great deal of faith in me, and when also um, Manny Wilkins, you know, I feel like him and I had a, a different kind of chemistry out there. You know, to where we would kind of we would look at each other and we would know what was going on. Um, you know, before the ball was even snapped, and you know, he had. He had the faith out there a lot to just let it rip, throw it up to me, and, you know, trust me to make a play. Gosh, won't that be nice when that happens, right? I mean, that does take time, right? No, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, the NFL is a completely different game. Um, you know, those deep balls are, are – it, it really is a, a, a chance, you know, yeah. taking a chance down there. But, you know, I feel like I have the frame and, you know, the ball skills, the ability to go up and, you know, make more of those plays than I don't make. At your time in New England, and I know you don't love talking about that. That is, but but just did you learn things that you say, okay, I'm not going to do it 
A, B, and C. This is how I'm going to do it from now on. I learned some things. You know, there's different personalities, different issues that, you know, relate to different things. Because, you know, when you get a first-round tag on you, I, I find it always interesting. You never ask to be a – you'd love to be a first-round pick, but you don't ask to be a first-round pick. Somebody projects you to be that, and then there's so much expectation that comes with it. It just brings a lot of people out of the closet, so to speak, and starts getting on you. Yeah, you know, I learned a lot just from my my three years there. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I have to go out there and play my game. Um, I know what I do well. I know what my strengths are. I know what my weaknesses are. So, um, you know, it's just the biggest thing I probably learned is, you know, just play my game. I know the type of player I am and, you know, have that confidence to go out there every game and um, show what I can do. You know, it's interesting. I keep hearing Matt Eberflus, I'm sure you already understand that, he says a lot of the same things every single week because that's the foundation of it. So, you know, his first rule of leadership, lead yourself. So are you doing that? Yes, definitely. Um, like I said, you know, I learned a lot about, you know, myself as a person um, from my past three years in New England. I grew a lot as a person um, in my past three years. So, you know, I feel like I'm at the point in my career and at the point in my life where I know myself very well. I know what I need to do on a day-by-day -day basis to get myself ready for a game, uh, mentally and physically. Um, this is my fourth year, so I'm a vet in this league. So, um, you know, I need to carry myself that way, and I have been carrying myself that way. Nikhil Harry, our guest here on Chicago Sports Radio 670, The Score. Jeff Joniak here. Tom Thayer will be along as well. We start breaking down the Miami Dolphins. Our pregame begins at 9, kickoff at noon on WBBM. I got to go back. I saw an old video of, the, of when you were drafted. It actually made me cry. It put tears in my eyes because the embrace now – was that your mother or was that your grandmother uh, on draft day? Um, the first person I hugged was my grandmother. Okay, that that embrace. I know there's deep history here. Uh, if you want to get into it a little bit, it's it's a very interesting and great story. But uh, so your grandmother Felna is that how you pronounce her name? What what did that moment signify? Um, it meant everything. Just because my grandmother, um, you know, she had a pretty rough upbringing. Um, she had to fight through a lot. You know, she went through so much, um, not only as a child, but, you know, as a grown woman. Hmm. Um, she was a single mother that had four kids um, by herself. And, you know, she had been retired back in St. Vincent. My whole family's from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So she had retired back there. And, you know, she took a chance on me. Um, she felt like it would have been a way better opportunity for me in the States. So she packed wow. it up. You know, started working again, um, you know, and then started all over, um, which most people wouldn't even have the guts to do, especially in a completely different country. Um, so that moment of getting drafted is kind of like everything hmm. came out, all the emotions over all those years. And, you know, I told myself I, was, I wasn't going to cry. Oh, they got you. Um, and, yeah, well, as, soon as, as soon as I heard my grandma start crying, yeah. it, it just. It was just so emotional. Like it came yeah. from deep down. I, I you could feel it in the in the video clip. Yeah, for, yeah. For everybody there, you know, friends, family. There was a lot of people. There was a lot of tears that came out that night. So that was definitely definitely a special night. So St. Vincent and the Grenadines uh, is Southern Caribbean, and uh, they just recently, at that time anyway, received their U.S. visa. So uh, is the bulk of your family now here? Um, no. So it's not. It's not quite that. Oh, okay. Um, simple. Um, they have. Um. They don't have their citizenship. They can okay. only come and stay for, I believe, it's six months at a time. And okay. They go back. And then Interesting. once they go back, it's kind of like a reset. So then they get another six months. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, they try to they try to make it out. And then my mother's, um, you know, she tries to come to as many games as she can. But, you know, it's, it's not that easy at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So how old were you when you got here? Um, so I was, f I believe, four years old when I first got to the States. Um, I had my green card for a while. I didn't get my citizenship until I was about, I believe it was 14 or 15 okay. years old. So I mean, that's a, that's a lot to, yeah. to dive into. Yeah. We don't have enough time to get into that <laughs> one. Uh, but, heck, you probably learned a lot about yourself, oddly, even at the age of four. Yeah, no. Do you even remember it real clearly? Yeah, I do, yeah. especially first coming to the States. Um, yeah. And especially because I had an accent when I first. Really? So it was it was difficult, man. You know, kids yeah. are, tend to be oh, yeah. very mean with, with, oh, with gosh. other kids when it comes to Please. Yeah. being different. So, yeah, it was it was rough at first. but I mean, Did it, it toughen was, you up? Um, or were you already tough? I feel like my, my, my upbringing was already a lot tougher than a lot of 
my friends that I had just because my grandmother was a lot more strict, you know, mm-hmm. that Caribbean background, especially old school Caribbean. So it was it was tough at times, but it was the best thing for me. Well, how would you define old school Caribbean? Um, <laughs> uh, put down. We're, 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 we're gonna. We're okay. Gonna, there's no. There's no debate. <laughs> it, there's no gray area. Yeah, no. No arguing back. Nothing like that. In addition to football, looks like you were a heck of a basketball player. And I would be disappointed if you weren't at six four and can leap out of a gym. Uh, how, how good were you? I feel like if I would have, I feel like so. I took a year off after my freshman year of basketball, and I feel like that's kind of when I started excelling, really excelling in football and when I started taking steps back in basketball. But I think I – I don't know if I would have made it to the league per se, but I feel like I could have gone a long way in basketball. Hmm. Yeah, you were AAU too, yeah? Yes, I'm yeah. at AAU. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's switch gears in our final uh, couple minutes with you uh, here with Nikhil Harry. Miami Dolphins, uh, they're coming into town. Uh, that defensive secondary is something. they got some really good talent in there. What's your uh, overall analysis as you get ready for the Dolphins? Um, they're a talented team, um, you know, they're very confident in their DBs. Um, so, you know, going into that game, we're going to have to win our one-on-one matchups. Um, we're going to have to make tough plays. Um, we're going to have to play gritty. So, you know, Bears football. Yeah, on the home turf after four trips in five weeks, it'll be good to be in, in front of the home crowd on what's supposed to be a great weather day. And, you know, trading players, it, it was a record number of deals yesterday in the National Football League for a trading deadline day. Obviously, Roquan Smith, a big name on this team. Do you feel there's enough leadership involved here the way Coach Eberflus has intended it to be, as I mentioned earlier, lead yourself, that you guys will pull together no matter what? You got almost treat it like season-ending injuries, right? Yeah, so absolutely. It was um, definitely not easy with the part of uh, guys like Roquan, uh, Robert. Yep. Um, but, you know, I feel like we have a lot of leadership on this team. You know, when we first even picked captains, I was like – it's a lot of people. <laughs> um, so I feel like we have a lot of leadership on this team, and, you know, we'll be just fine. Yeah, Justin Jones and Eddie Jackson move in. Jalen Johnson, the uh, honorary this week, so go get him. Appreciate all your time. Best of luck to you. You got a great story, and, uh, you know, good things are coming for you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Nikhil Harry, our guest, coming back next, will be joined by Tom Thayer here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. This segment of Bears All Access is brought to you by Athletico Physical Therapy. Visit athletico.com to request an appointment in clinic or virtually and start feeling better tomorrow. Welcome back to Bears All Access here on Chicago Sports Radio 670. The score, Jeff Joniak top there, and Joe Rose, 30-year veteran as analyst for the Miami Dolphins. But I always prefer Big Joe because you are a big personality. You're a media mogul down there. You've done Uh television. you got the morning show down there and the Odyssey family. Uh, you, you've got 30 years in the booth, but you know, you caught Dan Marino's first touchdown. So I know that's always tagged with you. You <laughs> might as well, after that, you might as well not play football because nobody cares. <laughs> anything, else, anything to do with Marino is all anybody wants to hear about. So you go, okay, you got me. I don't have the football. I wish I did. I went through a divorce at that point. I could have used the 50 grand, but I, I don't have it. <laughs> hey, what was it like playing with him? Certainly. And you put it in a contest a context and cr- contrast to what today's game has become with these mobile quarterbacks, a uh, guy like Tua, uh, and, and and a guy like Justin Fields who's got this dynamic running ability, but but Marino, he just stood there in the pocket and delivered it with probably the quickest release ever. He was good 40 or 50 years ago, and he would have been just as good in today's game with the quick release, yeah. the toughness. I know he always, and, and you probably hear this, he goes, man, I like to have these rules the quarterbacks have right now where guys can't hit me late, hit me low. He had like nine knee operations. Oh, that would be nice wow. not to have some guy go around the corner and buckle my back of my knee. And, yeah, you know, those guys always talk about the numbers they put up in today's game. Obviously, if they could take Mark and Mark with them, or in this case, Jalen and Tyreek wouldn't be a bad way to go either. <laughs> Joe, Joe, let's speed up to the modern-day podium. Because I don't know if Marino would be the type of guy that would like to go to the podium with such frequency and answer all these questions. However, Tua went out there and put this Super Bowl word at the podium midseason. How does that sit with you? Does it sit well with the Miami fan base? And is it all due just because of Chubb coming aboard? So uh, all great questions. And, and so my take is this, first of all, 
we haven't won a playoff game in 21 years. So, so we, we need to, we need to calm down. I, and I know they're aware of it because it's been brought up. We're right behind the lions for, for not winning a playoff game, just to give you an idea in this league. I've done the homework. So you guys don't have to look this up later. <laughs> so, uh, I'm glad he's pumped up and he's playing with ridiculous confidence and stuff, but Hey man, let's get deep in the playoffs. See how far we can take this thing. You know, it's going to be fun. And so I think everybody was caught a little bit by, you know, but the fact that honestly, he's been kind of a reserve guy till his confidence and ways playing right now. And, and so I think everybody around here for the most part was okay with it. But listen, we haven't won one of those Super Bowls since the early 70s. We've been a couple of times. We lost, but we haven't even been to one in a long, long time since I played in Super Bowl 17 and 19. So uh, it's been a long time to hear it, but I just take and, and love to see this team in the playoffs. And 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 by the way, we're, we're in AFC East with the Buffalo Bills, as you know, So uh, and they are damn good. We beat them once, but they are darn good right now. Well, one question to piggyback on that, because being with the Bears in 1985 in understanding that you guys had an offense that could beat any defense, including the 85 Bears. Now I see you guys having a super explosive offense, but is this a defense that can complement what your offensive firepower is? I, they got they got some pretty good players on the defense, and they obviously a- added Bradley Chubb to, for a pass rush. The four man pass rush hasn't been good enough. Uh, the five man hasn't been good, and it's hard to do those all out blitzes when you don't have Byron Jones on the other side like we did last year. So um, they've been real careful on that. It's a it's it's a fair question for sure. We got a lot of good players. Like to see some guys play better. Um, we have not put a complete game together yet where we've seen both sides of the football play well. Uh, but but I think overall defensively, we have to play a lot better um, if we're going to make a run at going deep into the playoffs. Former sure. Miami Dolphin tight end and 30-year veteran analyst on radio. Getting together. old, man. You're getting old. Nobody's down here getting old now. But, but once a dolphin, always a dolphin. You know that that group. And you guys all, you know, you guys for for, for whatever the comparisons could possibly be. Uh, the, obviously, the '85 Bears are uh, a group un, untouched in terms of personality and swag. But you guys down there had some pretty big personalities. Well, listen, I'm down here with Jimbo, and Jimbo and Danny are very close. And and I know Tom played with Jimbo. And so uh, and, I, and I've had a chance to, to do Ditka's event down here as well. I love the stories. Listen, the Buddy and, and Mike stories, some of the best NFL stories. Tom, you were there to see him and hear him. Uh, those are classics. So, so one day, can I tell the story, or is this not cool if I if I tell this? So, and it has to do with that Monday night football game. So, Mark Clayton was always the last guy in the locker room at half. My, you know, Mark Clayton kind of he just did his own thing. So he's coming in late. He says, "Man, I'm at the Orange Bowl, and I hear this this noise and two guys going at it." So he said, "I look down to the right, down the tunnel." He said. Buddy and, and Mike are getting ready to square off, and they actually got the police are breaking them up. He goes, if you don't change that effing defense and put another, go, I'll do it. You run your offense. I'll run my defense. I, and, and, and they, like, they're ready to go at it. Yep. And, and, and so Clayton comes in, and, and he tells the team, he goes, I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> These guys, <laughs> they're getting ready to square off. The police, the Miami police had to break them up. And I was like, oh, this is, Tom, I don't know, like, it was an amazing story at halftime of a frigging game, <laughs> knowing you guys are going to come out and make it a good game in the second half. Yeah, Sensic was one of our saviors that night. He was the one that kind of got in between them initially and said, all right, you guys, let's calm down. Let's make our 12-minute halftime adjustments and go out and get beat in the second oh. half. So, oh, you know, crazy. nothing got solved that night at halftime. I got to tell you, man, Chicago Bear stories from that team <laughs> are maybe the greatest – I've ever heard. I heard about a backup quarterback that wouldn't go in because Ditka was yelling at him. He was the only thing they had left, and he refused. So, Tom, I'm hearing this story, and I'm going, no way. And and he goes, I- I'm not going in unless Mike tells me right now he's going to be really nice to me. <laughs> and all the other quarterbacks are down. And, and and so Jimbo's telling this story, and I'm crying. I'm <laughs> crying like I'm got, trying to get this picture of God. You promise you're not going to yell at me. I'll go in, but you promise. 
And he's like, yeah, I, I promise, you know, just tell him what, whatever you need to hear. <laughs> I mean, you just don't get some of those stories and stuff. And then to hear the stories from the offense and the defense, you know, the average fan doesn't know that back then. You're what they don't have all that stuff we have now and coming out on social media to hear all those great stories between the offense and the defense. You put it together. It's one of the greatest football teams of all friggin' time. <laughs> You know, my Joe, my first start for Mike Ditka, we were playing the Redskins, and I was playing against uh, Dave Butts. We're winning by 40 points. I get a holding call in the fourth quarter, and he pulls me. <laughs> brings me to the sideline and yells at me like I just, you know, killed my dog. So, yeah, there's every story, believe it. It may yeah. sound bizarre, but it's true. I, I tell people how shoes used to talk on the sideline, the guys go, no way. I go, no way. You got confronted <laughs> before you got to the sideline. He was already he was already matched up with you, man. And you were going to hear about it. And it wasn't over because you still had film study on Monday or Tuesday morning. It, and, and that's when he called you out in front of the whole team. Nothing more embarrassing than being called out for whiffing on a block or dropping <laughs> a key football in front of the whole team where he'd run that projector back and forth, back and forth, man. It was like. How much more can you humiliate a man in front of all his teammates? And most of them were a lot better players than I was. Stop it. <laughs> Tom says that all the time about Ditka. <laughs> Here with Joe Rose, our remaining moments. Uh, we're trying to break down Bears-Dolphins, but the stories are better than the game. <laughs> honestly, <laughs> honestly, that's the case. All right, let, let's talk about uh, uh, a Cheetah, uh, the Blur Brothers. Uh, I don't know who coined the name, uh, but... I found it interesting in my statistical analysis, and I was on the score early the, uh, yesterday morning, and I said, gosh, they don't have a lot of yards after the catch. Second fewest yards after the catch by the Dolphins. So is this because Tua's accuracy is just getting the ball where it needs to be, when it needs to be there on time? Um, so I got to start with this. I, I was lucky enough to see Mark and Mark play, Clayton and Duper, um, and I used to think they got, they got open. I've never seen anything like Waddle and Tyreek and how open they are. You watch it on TV, and I'm waiting, and it's clear. Everybody said, don't get beat deep. I mean, I get it. My my ears are screaming, oh, they got the word, don't get beat deep, because they blow by the corners, and the safeties are just running back. You're not going to run by us. They're running square ends and, and, and post patterns that they're catching at 17, 18 yards. We just got every time you turn around, we're three plays, and we go from our own 20, 25 into the the the, the team we're playing against is 30, 35 yard line set up for at least a field goal. Um, I've never seen two guys uh, that open, and I got to start with Tyreek because he has been sensational. Loves to practice, plays hard, wants to be, and and will tell you he's the best and and back it up. Um, <laughs> and he's got great hands. They run great routes. They catch the ball in the middle of the field. Um, I now know, and I forgot, it's been a long time, what two number one wide receivers look like. And those two, um, 1A and 1B, are special, both of them. Is Tua the perfect quarterback for these guys? Because, listen, uh, Tua is better than what I thought he was going to be coming out of college. So is he the perfect guy for the complement of these two number ones? So so they're all in on him right now. And when I say they, the team, I, I see him last weekend and I was telling the story when I got home on the plane and, and in the hotel and, and see the way the guy's like, oh, yeah. And, and Tua, is, he, he didn't act like this the last couple of years with Brian Flores. It, it, it's a Brian Flores football team. It's, it's a different situation. I think we still need to see more, though. Drives fans nuts when I say this. He's got to stay. He's got to stay healthy. Um, he can throw it. And when they told him, "We're getting you a new coach who believes in you, and we're going to get you more weapons around it." Um, Teron Armstead never practices, and he just chews guys up at left tackle. I mean, the last two weeks, two of the best pass rushers. One, one. I think they each had one solo tackle in the game, so he's really helped. But adding that guy on the outside that we traded a lot of picks for and made him the highest paid receiver has made all the difference uh, in the world for him to go out. Mike Gesicki in the middle starting to catch footballs. We got backs that can catch it. 
Um, so he's got a lot of weapons. It's it's a lot easier to have a little uh, big time strut to you when you got that kind of horsepower around you like he does right now. You know, one thing is a hundred million dollars plus the chub. And you guys really don't know a lot about him other than seeing him from afar. Are you kind of um, torn? You, you gave him $100 million already without yeah. watching him practice, play, and his attitude in training camp? Or are you okay with that? So so I'm guessing I'm giving those guys in the front office the benefit of the doubt because he's been injured a lot. But when he's not injured, he seems to be really productive, has right. been the take. Um but I, I think they looked at our defense. We got – there's two ways to fix this. You either got to cover better or you got to put more pressure on the quarterback and then those guys – by the way, nothing against – it was like the Chicago Bears when you played. The 85 Bears, nothing against those guys. They weren't great cover guys. As You know, when we put our game plan together, Nat Moore, Mark Clayton, and Mark Duper, like, guys, if we can block them for a second with max protection – they can't cover our three guys. And that ended up being the difference in the game, Tom, if you're all right with me yeah. saying that here. Oh, yeah. But, but um, so so we decided, you know, we're hoping that Byron Jones come back at some point. Uh, we got some good corners that are young that are going to get better, but I think they're just like, we got to get pressure on the quarterback, and it will help those guys at the back end. All right, final question for Joe Rose, our guest here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670, The Score. Uh, I'm very intrigued by uh, two players on defense, Javon Holland, a second-year player who saw him at training camp, and I was like, wow, this is – this is because uh, I love safeties. I think you got to have a safety to be a playoff team. I love yeah. – sa- I want one bad bad man back there at safety. Yeah, and then 100. Where's Xavier Howard at? I know he's 29. He's a, a ball hawk, uh, but he's been targeted quite a bit. Is it? Is there a reason for that, or is it just because they're staying away from somebody else? No, he's a, he's a number one guy, and so he tried to play through this groin. Um, they redid his contracts to make sure his money stayed up at the top where it should be off of what he's done. Um, his groin ha- hasn't been. He took a week off. Um, he hasn't played as well as he played the last couple of years. There's no question about it. He's still our best guy out there, but the other guy, uh, Javon Holland, glad you said it, man. He can cover, he can blitz, and he can hit. He hits like he's about 225 or 230. He's He's got a lot of confidence. I think he's a little limited the way they can use him right now because he's playing with a lot of young guys that don't have a lot of experience the last couple of weeks. And I think he's, you know, he, you start trying to help everybody else and you forget your own assignment and uh, it can look bad, but he is special, man. They, uh, they hit a jackpot on this guy when he gets everybody back for sure. Everybody's taking the over, Big Joe. Everybody's <laughs> taking the over. All right, let's do it. I'm in on that one, too. I was trying to think of how I was going to handle that. All right, I'm with you on that. That's, I might already been there with you on that one. That's Joe Rose. Quite the entertaining uh, guest here on Bears All Access. Appreciate your time. We'll see you Sunday. Hey, Tom, Jeff, thanks, you guys, man. It was great being with you guys. We'll see you in a couple days. Very good. Awesome. Thank you, Safe Tom. travels. Tom and I back with one final segment to wrap things up here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Welcome back to Bears All Access, brought to you by IGS Energy, Choose clean energy for your home at IGS.com because every good choice adds up to a better world. With Tom Thayer, Jeff Joniak here on Bears All Access on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score. Uh, Some great conversations with Nikhil Harry and Joe Rose. Uh, I know we could have talked to Joe for uh, the full hour. Uh, So many great stories. But, you know, the guys on The Score on Friday morning, did I have it right that you were on a houseboat with Steve DeBerg or did I blow it? No, I did live on a houseboat when I was down in Miami because, you know, when you get when you get cut by the bears and you go down to Miami, you have about a six or eight hour notice. You pack a bag of equipment, you bring a bag of shorts and t-shirts and you <laughs> head down to Miami. And Steve and I happened to get uh, brought aboard in Miami on the same day. So we just kind of more, we are roommates on the road as well. So yeah, I had plenty of time out in uh, living the Harbor life. I yeah. felt like Gilligan for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, it was Shula m- more similar to Ditka than maybe we realize? Yes. My first game I was dressing, I, so I played 10 games in Miami. The first game I was dressing, I used to wear a really tight uniform because I sweat so bad it would loosen up. 
I was sitting at the bench with my pants up above my knees, and he came up and made a point of yelling at me before kickoff. He said, son, you can't wear your pants like that. they got to be covering your knees. And now you see it. No one was covering that. Wow. He's paying attention to me. Day one, start dressing for my first game. So it was an immediate example of he wasn't going to play any favorites, and he – had an eye on everybody on the team, offense, defense, special team. So I kind of felt um, proud that I got yelled at before I ever took the field for Don Shula. And um, I admire him, um, you know, my opportunity to play for a guy like him. I just still, you know, I know this is not previewing the game, but, uh, and you've said it many times. And for those who don't know, just the, the lineage of, uh, of your touchstones in your life, uh, going back to Joliet and, you know, a famous coach there, a uh, famous coach in Mike Ditka playing for a famous Papa Bear, uh, his franchise, the start of the National Football League to the USFL, and George Allen who was on di- uh, the staff of George Hallis at one time to Mike Ditka to Don Shula. It's unbelievable what you've been coached by, honestly. Yeah, and you know, th- even going back to some of the ac- assistant coaches when I was at Notre Dame for Danny Vine, you know, uh, John Gruden's father, Jim Gruden, uh, Jim Johnson, the great defensive coordinator who passed away too early. Uh, Gene, uh, Gene Smith, who is now the athletic director of Ohio State. So you've met all kinds. I've had the opportunity to meet all kinds of personality and every single one of them have, have left an impression on me. And including the legend. Clyde Emmerich. Yes. Which is just yeah. another one. You know, you, you've been touched by so I, I, many people. Right, the first strength coach in the history of the NFL. I think he's the type of guy that should be brought up, should be put in the NFL Hall of Fame because what now all these other guys are flourishing with in the terms of strength and conditioning and hydration and everything, Clyde was years ahead of his time. And I know he, he was a high school coach and a college baseball coach, Gordy Gillespie. Did, did he teach you things about offensive line play that you used? Oh, of course. Yeah. First of all, we only ran the ball. So it was, it was, you know, do your things right. You know what his idea was? If you're on the offensive line, just remember, you, the, if you're on the back side of a play, your blocks are equally as important or as if you were the front point of attack. And so some of the scheming that he had, some of the, the, the areas of responsibility we had as a backside tackle, you'd think, oh, my God, these will never factor in the success of a play. But then all of a sudden you're blocking a defensive back downfield from the opposite side of the field, and the running back runs, you know, alongside of you. So, yeah, the importance of every single one of the offensive linemen, including the tight ends, everybody played a big role. The Bears matchup with the Dolphins brought to you by Dr. Pepper, the one Bears fans deserve. Jeff Joniak, Tom Thayer here as the Bears and Dolphins get together tomorrow, 9 a.m. our pregame noon kickoff on WBBM, certainly pre- and post-game here on the score as well. All right, let's uh, just do some quick hitters here to wrap us up uh, about how this game is to be won. Got an explosive team that can put up a lot of points. Their defense, a little suspect, though, Chubb comes in. He can rush the passer right away. You don't need to tell him too much about their defense to get that done. They are sixth against the run, stopping it. The Bears have the number one. That's their that's their bread and butter. What tips this game, honestly? It is the running game. It's the, how do you keep their offense all the, off the field? If you can go for those time-consuming drives that you know don't allow the opponent's offense to be on the field, that's when you're going to increase your opportunity for success. And then you don't allow Chubb to be a pass rusher. So when you put Chubb in the game and it, you do have a huddle called of where to line up, what your responsibility is in the run game, you do have to have some knowledge of the defense. If you put him on the field in this third and 15, he knows exactly what he's going to do. So I think the continuous support of the running game the Justin Fields being a dynamic double threat where he doesn't, the defenders don't know whether to rush him or cover. I do think the Bears offense this week has an, an opportunity 
to have running game success like they've had throughout the season. Calling all Bears fans. Get the ultimate VIP fan package with Chicago Bears VIP. Secure a game ticket and appearance from Bears legends and more by visiting ChicagoBearsVIP.com. Given what we heard from Joe Rose and what we've seen on tape of Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle, but, you know, the other aspect of this is that uh, 11 different guys have touched the football. Six different guys have scored touchdowns for them. They do have a running game, and Raheem Mostart, and he is also a guy who can catch the football. They have matchup issues that is going to put the Bears defenders in conflict here. you got some new guys that are going to get a lot more snaps, I would think, uh, Jack Sanborn uh, particularly, but also what awaits those defensive backs here, and, and what do you do with the safeties? Do you play them deepest of the deep and just make sure you keep everything in front of you and make tackles? You're going to have to play them deep, and you're going to have to tell the cornerbacks the smallest window is an opening for Tua. He's got great accuracy. That's one thing that surprises me most about the emergence of Tua is the fact that he doesn't have superior arm strength like Dan Marino, but he's got superior targeting from the quarterback position. All right, Tom, that's going to wrap us up. Uh, Good show. Thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, Big Jeff. That's Tom Thayer. Thanks to our guests, Nikhil Harry, the Bears veteran wide receiver, Joe Rose, the analyst of the Miami Dolphins Radio Network. Thanks to our producers here at The Score, Dan Brilli and Jordan Tradeup as well. We'll talk to you next time on Bears All Access here on Chicago Sports Radio 670 The Score.